back to the Gospel Unleashed, our increasingly comprehensive look at the early church in the book of Acts. I remember when Steve and I were talking about this series back in December, we imagined it would take about six to eight weeks, but obviously we've gone on a little bit longer than that. But I guess that's what happens when you take time to really explore a book of the Bible. Sometimes it has more to say to you than you first expect. Um, This is actually week 15 and coincidentally we have arrived at chapter 15, which just so happens to be my favourite in the entire book. I know we've had some exciting chapters already, the Holy Spirit's arrival at Pentecost, the healing of the man in his 40s, the angelic jailbreak, the controversial story of Ananias and Sapphira, Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey last week. It's been quite the adventure, but In my mind, this chapter surpasses them all because this chapter is all about, wait for it, a church meeting. Whoa! Hold on to your hats, folks. It's about to go off. We've got nearly an entire chapter about a meeting. Can you imagine anything more thrilling? Not only that, but we actually get to read the email they sent after the meeting as well. I know, I'm spoiling you. But all joking aside, this meeting is arguably the most important meeting in church history. Its outcome decided the direction of travel for the church for millennia. This wasn't a meeting about whether the toilet should be painted blue or green. No, no, this was far more significant. And the question on the table was this. What does it mean for somebody to be saved by Jesus? So let's dive in, shall we? Chapter 15, verse 1 says this. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. So we're in Antioch again, and if you cast your minds back to chapter 11, you might recall that some of the believers who'd been scattered after the persecution at the end of chapter 8 ended up here. And as well as preaching the gospel to the Jews, they also preached to the Greeks, and a great many believed their message. And so the church in Jerusalem, which was kind of the head church at the time, sent Barnabas to investigate. Barnabas, liked what he saw, went to fetch Paul from Tarsus and they both stayed in Antioch teaching and encouraging the believers for quite a while. And it was here that the believers first became called Christians. And that's significant because up until this point, the church had been predominantly Jewish, which made sense if you think about it. For starters, Jesus was Jewish. Hopefully that's not a, a shocking revelation to you. Um, His disciples were also Jewish and they didn't switch religions when they met Jesus. They simply came to believe that Jesus was the promised Jewish Messiah. And the early church was the same. The Jews who heard their message didn't suddenly start thinking of themselves as Christian. They just decided that Jesus was their saviour. If you had been there and you had asked them, what religion are you? They would have said, I don't speak English. But I'm Jewish. And because they were Jewish, they did their best to follow the Torah, God's sacred word to them and uphold the Jewish traditions. The development of Christianity as a faith that stood outside of Judaism is actually the very thing that we see happening here in the book of Acts. Because for the first time, people who were not from a Jewish heritage were deciding that they too wanted to be followers of Jesus. And this was problematic because these new people, well, they didn't know the Torah. They were outsiders, outsiders who by their very presence were beginning to change the definition of what it meant to be Jewish. The Jewish people recognised that for whatever reason, God was interested in saving these outsiders, but How exactly was that going to work? How does a non-Jewish person accept a Jewish saviour without first becoming Jewish? And and what happens when they do? How are they supposed to 
fit into the existing community. They don't know the rules. They don't dress in the right way. They don't know how to behave in the temple or to pray properly. And some of them are even sinful, working on the Sabbath, eating meat sacrificed to other gods and so on. And the more people that believe the gospel message, the messier things got. And if these outsiders kept coming in, then the Jewish identity would be diluted to such a point that they might not even be recognisable as a nation anymore. And so they needed a solution. And the answer was obvious. Simply teach the outsiders how to be Jewish. Step one, get circumcised. God had said to Abraham that every male among you shall be circumcised. And so if the Greeks want to join in, that's what they need to do. Makes sense, right? <laughs> well, can you imagine being at that meeting? You know, Paul gets on stage and says, we've got some guest speakers this morning all the way from Judea. Please make them feel welcome. And they get up and they're like, yeah. So, hi. Yeah, good morning. Greetings from Judea. Uh, we know that you think Jesus has saved you uh, and he will. Don't worry. But first, we, we just need all the men to line up by the stage and. And Keith is going to use that knife there to do a quick operation. It'll, it'll only sting for a minute. And then there's a couple of other things that we, we need you to change about yourself as well. <laughs> I don't think there would have been too many amens during that particular meeting. Anyway, in the middle of whatever presentation they were doing, Paul and Barnabas decide to put a stop to it. It says in verse two that Paul and Barnabas were brought into sharp dispute and debate with them. And they end up being appointed, along with some other believers, to go to Jerusalem, to the apostles, to the elders, to decide what to do about this. And that's what they do. And, and when they get there, they start to talk about all that God has been doing among them, which I'm sure included not only uh, the Greek believers in Antioch, but all the stuff they saw in their first missionary journey. All the people that were saved, people like Sergius Paulus, if you can remember him. But the Pharisees, who were also believers, argued their corner, saying they need to be circumcised and and required to keep the law of Moses. So already things are beginning to escalate. Now, we do need a bit of care here. Otherwise, we might end up labelling the Pharisaic believers as the bad guys in the story. But they weren't. Their desire was that these new converts will be able to participate fully in the community that by changing their appearance and their behavior they might fit in with everyone else and what's more that that argument was based in the scriptures they weren't just making this stuff up out of thin air they actually cared about what god had to say and they thought they were helping these new converts to live a life that was pleasing to god so this isn't a meeting between those with ill intentions and those with good intentions. No, no. This is a deba debate among believers about the nature of salvation. What's truly required for someone to be saved. And so the apostles had to consider these issues carefully to avoid a church split. And after a while, Peter gets up and he says this. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe, referring to his vision and subsequent experience in the house of Cornelius back in chapter 10, if you're keeping up. God knows the heart and he showed acceptance by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try and test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, no, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we're saved just as they are. And Peter makes a couple of excellent points here. Firstly, he recognises that God has already given the Gentile believers the Holy Spirit. In other words, they're already in. It's no use saying you've got to be circumcised to be saved. The stable door is open, the horse is bolted, so to speak. In fact, you might recall him saying back in chapter 10, can anyone keep these people from being baptised with water? <laughs> 
They've already received the Holy Spirit. I mean, at this point, it's it's just a formality. I may have added that last bit, but you get the point. If God has decided to save someone, there's not much that you or anyone else can do about it. But I kind of love his second point even more. He says the reason that Jesus came was to save us from ourselves because we were unable to keep the law. Why then would we insist that others have to first keep the law in order to be saved? That's that's bonkers. It doesn't doesn't make any sense. We don't need to be asking them to do something that we couldn't even manage ourselves. No, no. He says what we need is grace. And this opens up the door for people to start to really listen to what God had been doing. Paul and Barnabas tell story after story about how the Gentiles had been experiencing the grace of God for themselves. And when they finished, James, Jesus' brother, gets up and says this. Brothers, listen to me. Simon, that's Peter, has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. And that's a very provocative way for him to phrase it, because the nation of Israel understood themselves as a people for his name. And then he quotes Amos. He says, after this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even All the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord. And he concludes this way. It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat of strangled animals and from blood. For the law of Moses is preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue every Sabbath. And then he drops the microphone sits back down and I I sort of imagine the place erupting into rapturous applause. But I love that phrase. We should not make it difficult for those who are turning to God. I wonder, as I've been telling this story, who have you been identifying with the most? Paul and Barnabas, Peter and James, who seem to be thinking that grace is the only means of salvation or the visitors from Judea and the Pharisaic believers who believe that there should actually be some appeal to the law. Because whether we want to admit it or not, it's actually really easy for us to make salvation more about the doctrine of our faith than our faith in Jesus. Especially when it comes to those who don't think or act as we do. Do we expect people to change before we can accept that Jesus has saved them? What if the work that God needs to do in someone's heart is actually going to take a really long time? Do we make space for them or do we say, well, until you've sorted yourself out, you're not coming in here? What if the way that someone chooses to live their life never lines up with the way that we think they should live their life? What then? Do we write them off because they don't fit into the paradigm of what we think a Christian life should look like? Or do we accept them as they are because we recognise that it's only by the grace of God that we have been saved and we don't have the right to tell others that they need to earn their salvation? It's a tricky one, because, as I say, the Pharisaic believers really thought that they were helping the Gentile believers towards salvation. But what I actually think is happening here is that the church is learning to love like Jesus. The church is learning to choose grace over legalism. Do you remember when that woman was um, caught in the act of adultery and, and hauled before Jesus? The teachers of the law said Moses has commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? What position did Jesus take? Well, firstly, he reminded them that they were all in the same boat. He said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then when no one did, he said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she replied. 
then neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. And whether she did or not, he still died in her place. Grace, mercy, love above legalism and law. I think it's interesting what James asks the Gentile believers to abstain from. Food polluted by idols, sexual immorality, meat of strangled animals and from blood. Why these specific things and not others? Well, the rules seem to have been taken from Leviticus 17 and 18. And given the context, I think what James is trying to do is find a way for the church to remain together by learning to love each other well. Essentially, what he's asking the Gentile believers to do is refrain from practices that the Jewish believers would have found offensive. Something that Paul was a, a big advocate of. He once said that um, about eating meat sacrificed to idols. If what I eat causes a brother or sister to fall into sin, I'll never eat meat again. Personally, he, he had no issue with it, but he recognised that others did. And so he chose what he describes as the still more excellent way of love. And the rules that James give, they've got nothing to do with salvation. They're about showing respect to each other, learning to make room for those who think differently to you and to recognise the work of Jesus in everyone. How good are we at that? I'd love to be able to conclude this morning's talk by saying that from that moment on, the church learned its lesson and always acted in the most loving way, making space for everyone. But Actually, I think this is a lesson that the Holy Spirit has needed to reteach many, many times throughout church history. As I read this chapter again this week, I was reminded of the tireless campaigning of Clarkson and Wilberforce as they sought to abolish the slave trade in Britain. It was hard for Britain to give up on the slave trade because it was one of its most profitable businesses. And so all sorts of ways were found to justify it, one of which was the Bible passionate Christians would argue for its continuation, finding all the approval they needed in scripture, whether it was really there or not. But the Quakers said, no, no, this is immoral. It's a, a blight on humanity, evil. And after many years of campaigning, the slave trade was finally abolished in 1807. And the church had to look again at the scriptures and realise that perhaps it was not as they'd first thought. Perhaps the message of freedom and salvation was actually for everyone and there's been other groups of people too that the church has kept at arm's length throughout history nearly always to its detriment i thank god that we belong to a church that embraces female leadership just as we see time and time again in scripture people like deborah and miriam and esther and maria and lydia and phoebe and priscilla and so on and so on but it hasn't always been the case there have been occasions where the church has even fought amongst itself over the correct application of scripture and ended up tearing itself apart as a result. Have we learned the lesson yet? Salvation is for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. We need to learn this individually and as a church so that we can be the kind of place that does not make it difficult. For those who are turning to the Lord. No matter who they are. I love Paul's words in his letter to the Galatians. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptised into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. He says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. Those were the divisions that existed in his day. I wonder... Who would be on that list in our day? Rich or poor, liberal or conservative, gay or straight, trans or cis, black or white, native or foreign. None of it matters because as Paul writes, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Together, let's be those who pursue the still more excellent way. So God, our Heavenly Father, may we be those who do not make it difficult for others. May we offer the gospel to others as freely as we have received it with no strings attached. May we not expect others to conform to a standard that we ourselves have never reached. May we be gracious and loving towards those who do not act or think as we do. And may we pursue unity 
and peace above all else, recognising that your salvation is for everyone. In Jesus' name, Amen. I hope you enjoyed chapter 15 and I'll see you soon.